Hello and welcome back to another episode of The Mushroom Show. Today we are interviewing Shelby Hartman. She is the CEO and co-founder of Double Blind Magazine, which is so much more than just a magazine. They're also an education platform and media company that is really at the leading edge or the frontier of the psychedelic movement. Now, why are we talking about psychedelics on The Mushroom Show? Well, of course, it's impossible to ignore the effect of psilocybin and psilocybin containing mushrooms and the changing narrative that is happening right now in terms of these substances. Shelby is an absolute expert in this space and why I'm so excited to talk to her is because she has this rare combination of two different things. Number one, she is a journalist. She actually has a master's degree in long form journalism, but she also has what seems to be a lifelong passion for psychedelics and an interest in psilocybin mushrooms. So combining those two things, you really get a knowledgeable perspective and a really important perspective on everything right now that is happening in the space. So we talk about the potential path to legalization for psilocybin containing mushrooms. We talk about all the cool stuff that they're doing over at Double Blind. We of course talk about some of the research that's being done and some of the therapeutic use cases for psilocybin, the importance of integration and how to integrate some of these experiences that people have. And we also talk about the differences between microdosing and macrodosing and the importance of both of those things. So I think you're really gonna enjoy this conversation. Again, it's wide ranging, but it is a really fascinating and interesting topic. If you want, you can jump to any section we put time timestamps in the description and we've also put all the links to a lot of the stuff that Shelby talked about during the show. So I really hope you enjoy this conversation with Shelby Hartman. Shelby Hartman, welcome to the Mushroom Show. We are so happy to have you here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm super excited to talk to you because I feel like something special happens when two seemingly disparate skill sets come together to produce something that's really needed. And in your case, that's obviously uh, a credentialed and uh, great background in journalism, but also a passion and an interest in, in psychedelics. And why I think that's super important is because so often the stories we hear and the information we get from the, you know, the mainstream media is, is kind of uninformed. But in your case, you obviously have a strong passion for it and it's coming from a place of knowledge on these topics. So I'd love to start asking you, where did that come from? Where, where did your interest in, in psychedelics and wanting to tell these stories come from? Um, well, I've been doing psychedelics since I was 18 when I was in college, but I didn't start writing about drugs until 2015. I received a press release from the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, otherwise known as MAPS. They had received some significant amount of funding, I can't remember how much, for their trials investigating MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder. And I pitched the story to my editor at Vice, and she said, go for it. And so I reported the story and published it. And as is the case often in journalism, one story becomes another, becomes another. And one day I woke up and I was like, oh, I'm a psychedelic drug journalist. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, well, I mean, you seem to have come across it at a very important time uh, when the narrative does seem to be shifting on a massive scale. Of course, part of that is because of the stuff that you're doing and the stuff that you're writing about. But in general, I think the consensus around these things uh, seems to be shifting. But to give the people listening, the people watching a little bit of a background, too. So, again, your background is in journalism, but you are the co-founder and the current CEO of something called Double Blind. So why don't you tell us what Double Blind is and uh, what, what you guys are doing over there? Well, Double Blind currently has two sort of arms. One arm is the media arm, which is... Uh, a steady stream of online articles that we publish pertaining to all things psychedelics from psychedelic drug development to what's happening with local decriminalization initiatives and policy reform efforts to what's, you know, efforts being taken to preserve the traditional uses of plant medicines in indigenous contexts. Um, and then we also have a physical print magazine where we cover all the same things. And then the second arm of the business is we kind of refer to it as like the master class of psychedelics. So we do education with leading psychedelic experts. We have courses and webinars where people get live support on things like microdosing, how to grow mushrooms, how to trip sit. 
and um, really just trying to kind of be the one-stop shop for people who are looking to embark on a journey with psychedelics and or support other people on their journey with psychedelics. I think that's filling a super important space because again, like I said, you know, I think a lot of the information specifically in the mainstream media about psychedelics is, it seems misinformed. And I think the more, um, you know, properly informed uh, information or, pro you know, properly researched information we can get out there uh, in the community generally, I think is a, a super positive thing because, um, like I said, I've been paying attention to this space for a super long time. And it does seem that the public perception of, uh, of psilocybin mushrooms specifically, psychedelics in general, but psilocybin mushrooms specifically, seems to be changing to the positive. And just, you know, general acceptance of these mushrooms uh, in general. And I feel like it's something similar to what was happening to cannabis in, say, the early knots, or maybe 15 to 20 years ago, as the public perception was changing. And that eventually led to a change in the, in the laws, like in Canada, where I'm from, for example, um, cannabis is federally legal. I know a lot of the laws are changing in the United States as well. What are some of the differences do you see in the path to legalization? I know you talk a lot about policy, um, but specifically for psilocybin-containing mushrooms and psychedelics, how do you see the path to legal legalization unfolding in the U.S., and do you think it's going to be similar to what's happening in cannabis? It's going to be different, likely, um, because what we saw with cannabis is that we saw, obviously, states first decriminalizing cannabis and then legalizing it for medicinal purposes and then legalizing it for recreational purposes. Um, and, you know, in the United States, we still don't have legal federal cannabis. And we, I mean, it might happen sometime soon. We just saw a bill get um, approved by the, the House of Representatives for cannabis, but we don't know what the timeline is like there. Um, on the flip side with psychedelics, we're seeing that psilocybin is probably going to be legal federally as a prescription medication, at least in the United States, in the next three to five years. It's being researched right now for major depressive disorder and treatment-resistant depression. Well, it's being researched for a lot of different things, but those are the two main conditions that it's been given breakthrough therapy status for by the Food and Drug Administration which essentially means that it's been fast-tracked to be approved as a federal, um, as an FDA-approved medication. Um, and, um, you know, we are also seeing the way we did in cannabis, um, counties one at a time decriminalizing psychedelics, but uh, we're, it seems, a really long way away from states just legalizing recreational psilocybin. Um, Oregon in November did become the first state to legalize psilocybin for medical purposes, so in a therapeutic context. But um, that's obviously very different than like a dispensary opening and anyone being able to go and just like buy mushrooms. Right. Yeah, I mean, it seems like there's almost two paths there. Again, there's the medical side where they're using specifically um, synthetic psilocybin, it seems like, for a lot of these trials. And then, of course, on the other side, there is, the, you know, the recreational use. How do you see those two different use cases? Do you feel like psilocybin or psilocybin-containing mushrooms have a place in both, um, you know, recreational legalization and also in the therapeutic sense? I mean... Personally, yes. <laughs> we often say at Double Blind that we don't like to create a hierarchy of set and setting. What we mean by that is set and setting was a term that was popularized by Timothy Leary, Richard Alpert, and Ralph Metzner when they were all investigating uh, mushrooms, psilocybin at Harvard um, prior to the Controlled Substances Act being passed in 1970. And set and setting is, you know, it's the mindset that you go into when you're taking a psychedelic setting is the environment that you're in when you're taking that psychedelic. So when we say we don't want to create a hierarchy of set and setting, what we mean by that is that we don't necessarily think that, you know, doing psychedelics in a clinical context with an eye shade and two therapists holding your hands 
is necessarily more legitimate than, say, doing psychedelics in a ceremonial context the way they have been for thousands of years, or even just doing psychedelics at a festival or with your friends while camping. Um, we understand at Double Blind that you know, what we've seen emerge in cannabis is sort of this false dichotomy between recreational and medical use. It doesn't account at all for the fact that oftentimes people can have a psychedelic experience or even an experience on cannabis that is intended to be recreational and turns out to be very therapeutic or an experience that is intended to be therapeutic and ends up actually bringing the person a lot of joy and introducing like a sense of play um, into their into their bodies or you know it's just it's arbitrary to say like this is what psychedelics are for and this is only how they can be used because we just know that that's not actually how these experiences unfold in reality um but yeah in from a policy perspective it obviously gets a lot trickier because the difference between cannabis, one of the biggest differences between cannabis and a classic psychedelic, whether we're talking about mushrooms or LSD or DMT, is that, you know, granted, yeah, if you do an edible or you take a hit of a dab rig or something like that, you can end up having a very, very psychedelic experience where you lose perception of space and time. But generally speaking, when you smoke cannabis, you are functional, whereas oftentimes when you do a large dose of a psychedelic, you're really not safe to drive, not safe to just be out in the world interacting with people at all. And so we do have to think about that from a regulatory perspective. If we're, think if we're talking about, you know, legalizing psychedelics recreationally, how are we going to make sure that, you know, this comes along with robust public education campaigns so that people are prepared for these experiences and all the things that might emerge. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, you, you touched on a lot of really important things there. It's like, you know, it seems like the the legal framework in Canada anyways around the utilization of, um, you know, psilocin, psilocybin is around things like end of life anxiety or really serious conditions. Um, but I do think we need to leave room obviously for um, situations where, uh, because again, you said it's, it's hard to say exactly what the benefit of a, an experience might be and to just kind of silo it into these very specific use cases maybe isn't the best way to go about it. But again, from a regulatory perspective, as these things are trying to be legalized, it doesn't make sense to build a framework. Now I've heard this idea of, um, like almost like a licensing so uh, you could go and you could be educated on these substances and obtain a license uh, to be able to purchase them or to use them, um, you know, recreationally. And, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting concept because as you touched on as well, it seems like the big gap is just education. And if we had the right education in our society, we wouldn't have problems with these things. Uh, I'd like to get your opinion on that. What do you think about this idea of obtaining like a, a license to be able to use these things? To be honest, I don't know what I think about that. I mean, on the one hand, I do think it's important, like, like I said before, that people understand what they're getting themselves into and that they are prepared before they embark on an experience like this because all kinds of things can happen. I mean, especially if a person has trauma and they might not even realize that they have trauma could be, you know, intergenerational or ancestral or something that goes back to their childhood that they don't remember. I mean, that stuff can emerge in a situation where you're just trying to have fun with your friends. So it is really important that people are equipped and they understand what they're getting themselves into. On the other hand, you know, I'm definitely in favor of cognitive liberty and this idea that, you know, everybody has the right to explore their own consciousness. Actually, I'm sort of um, a libertarian in as much as I believe that everyone should have the right to do whatever it is that they want as long as they're not harming themselves or other people. And what we saw in cannabis is that, you know, as soon as governments get involved and as soon as regulations get involved, you know, there there is always a shadow side to that. There's always unintended consequences that people get locked out, that there's barriers to entry, barriers to access, that, you know, it's just... 
what we really don't want to see is we don't want to see what happened in cannabis happen to psychedelics, where people who either want to participate in the industry, who have been advocating for the overturning of psychedelic prohibition for a really long time, are left behind because they don't have the capital necessary to compete in the marketplace, or people who really need access to this medicine don't have it because they don't have the resources or the know-how to navigate you know, the bureaucracy necessary to get access. So like, it's, uh, it's just, it's all very, very complicated. Yeah, I totally see where you're coming from. Because I see both sides of that argument as well. It's like, if you need a license, who decides who can get a license to utilize something that literally grows out of, you know, cow shit. (laughs) But on the other side of the coin, again, education is so important. And um, we don't necessarily have the right structure in our culture and our society for people to, um, you know, have all the right information required to be able to properly, uh, which is kind of a loaded word, but properly use these things. So it is a really interesting question, and it'll be interesting to see how indeed it does unfold. Now, of course, as the narrative is changing, as, you know, decriminalization and legalization is potentially imminent, a lot of companies are getting involved as well, uh, which, you know, on one side is good because it's growing the awareness, it's growing the network, it's allowing for a lot of entrepreneurship around these topics. Um, but there's also a lot of companies that just seem to be cashing in. You're seeing a lot of these public companies, especially in Canada, like there's a lot of pumping and dumping going on. Um, are you seeing a lot of that uh, in the U.S. as well? And what is your opinion on um, kind of businesses that are built around this kind of new, you know, industry? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of businesses um primarily in the realm of psychedelic drug development that um, are getting into the industry and it's unclear what their intentions are and it's unclear how much promise that their business plan actually has. So one of the things that really struck me the most is I reported a story for, I think it was the fifth issue of the magazine, I can't remember, but essentially it was on the ethics of psychedelic drug development and patenting psychedelic compounds And as I started to look into more than a dozen different psychedelic drug development companies that had really fancy websites and press releases about all the things they were doing in the realm of psychedelics, what I realized is that there are very, very few psychedelic drug development companies that have actually gotten this, gotten a novel compound or delivery system into humans. So a lot of these companies are in what's called pre doing preclinical research right now, which means that they're doing, you know, they're, they're researching, they're, do, they're doing um, animal studies, or they, you know, they just they haven't even gotten approval by the FDA to actually like research the safety and efficacy of these various compounds. So, um, you know, how many of them are actually going to get all the way through the FDA approval process is yet to be seen. Um, There's a lot of people, longtime psychedelic advocates who um, hypothesize that trying to kind of like take the bad trip out of the trip or to try and like develop a psychedelic that doesn't make you trip at all just isn't going to work. So there's like that whole batch of companies who are like trying to basically develop like new psychedelic compounds or treatments that don't exist yet. There's also like a whole batch of companies that are trying to take compounds that already exist and that people know about, whether it's like psilocybin, LSD, ibogaine, MDMA, etc. through the FDA for a unique indication. So for example, psilocybin is in the public domain. Nobody can patent psilocybin, but you can try and research psilocybin for a unique indication. So say like psilocybin for weight loss. I just made that up. Um, That also like there's also a lot of like ethical considerations around that because like, again, psilocybin has been in the public domain for decades and to take a compound that like has been used ceremonially for thousands of years as well and to try and like slap like a unique indication on it is just... I don't know. Is that is there really any IP there? Right. Like TBD. Yeah, it it's definitely a, a question of of ethics, right? Because again, th- th- well, there's a couple of things with psilocybin. Number one is you know it's been around and it's probably pretty good as is. It's got a long history of use. But the third thing is that you know you don't actually need that much of it. So like if you were a company building you know building a company around the sale of psilocybin 
or psilocybin containing mushrooms like you don't need that much it's not like people use it every day like they would cannabis um which i guess brings to the question of microdosing, which i, I do want to talk about in a minute um but I did want to get your opinion on that. On that note, what do you believe are the differences between you know synthetically produced psilocybin versus using the whole mushroom? Um, obviously, there are compounds in the whole mushroom uh, other than just psilocybin. But what is your opinion on you know those two things that are emerging? Um, well, you know, as with many um, questions people have about the therapeutic potential of different psychedelics. They can be answered in one of two ways. One is like, what is my instinct or like bias on the matter? And two is like, what does the data say? So my instinct or bias would be to say like that the whole psilocybin mushroom probably has whole psilocybin mushrooms probably have additional medicinal or therapeutic benefits that we're unaware of simply because I'm kind of a hippie. And I believe that like, you know, nature has been developing these things. I mean, mushrooms have existed for what, like hundreds of thousands of years, probably longer. They're probably some of the oldest organisms on planet earth. Um, And, you know, there's no way for us to know. I mean, there's more than 180 different kinds of psilocybin containing mushrooms, and they all have like different alkaloids, different compounds within them. So, you know, in the same way that like a lot of scientists have hypothesized in the same way that, you know, there's tons of different kinds of cannabis and that every single human being has a unique endocannabinoid system and that like the different terpenes and things all work differently on each individual human, I would hypothesize that the same would be true for psilocybin containing mushrooms. But if we're going to, you know, look at the data, the reality is that there isn't any. Um, There's only been research done, as you mentioned, on synthetic psilocybin. Primarily, this is because Um, it's really hard to study a, like a plant or a fungus that grows in nature as it grows in nature, um, and get approval to do so through the FDA because, and I would imagine Canada's regulatory body is similar because, um, they want everything to be super standardized so that they can understand the results as clearly as possible. And even two mushrooms that are growing next to one another in the same, like, bin, for example, if you're growing mushrooms at home are going to have varying levels of, you know, psilocybin and all the other compounds that are in those mushrooms. And so it's just like, it's really, really hard to research. But I know that a lot of people are interested in doing this research. And hopefully in the next like, five to 10 years, we're going to have a clear understanding of what the differences are. Yeah. And that's a really good point um, that I hadn't really thought about before. It's not just the difference between whole mushroom and synthetic psilocybin. The whole mushrooms themselves, like you mentioned, hundreds of species, lots of different compounds. And unfortunately, because of the regulatory framework over the last however many years, we haven't really been able to study them to the extent that they should be studied. And there's even something as simple as, you know, wood lovers paralysis um, that people are looking at now where this is the the idea that some psilocybe mushrooms or some mushrooms in the psilocybe genus that grow on wood tend to cause this thing called paralysis um, where people get like weak muscles for a number of hours and it doesn't seem to happen all the time it seems to be maybe species dependent and dose dependent some people think it's because of a certain alkaloid some people think it's because maybe they're contaminated but like we really don't know. And that's just the tip of the iceberg of things that we don't know about, um, you know, psilocybin containing mushrooms. So it's a, (laughs) it's a very interesting question. What, what do you know about wood lovers paralysis? Actually, have you, have you looked into that at all? Um, I haven't looked into it too much. All I know is that it's not very common, but if it does happen, it's terrifying. Right. I, I hadn't even known it was a thing until I was reading some article about Oregon legalizing it. And they were saying they're trying to decide on what species and they weren't, you know, part of the bill was they weren't going to allow people to grow them on wood because of wood lovers paralysis. And I was just like, this is ridiculous. But then I actually looked into it. I was like, oh, wow. You know, there are certain species of um, psilocybe that might cause this. And we don't really know. A super interesting topic that I definitely want to learn more about. Um, Speaking about, you know, psilocybin in general, 
there, there was a study, one study that I looked at that's really interesting talking about you know, smoking uh, addiction and being able to recover from addiction in general um, with psychedelics or with psilocybin. And a lot of emphasis was placed on cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT as part of the treatment protocol. Can you talk a little bit about intentionality if you are trying to, uh, you know, achieve some sort of outcome through the use of psilocybin mushrooms and how, uh, you know, the way either through CBT or other, you know, types of ceremony, how important that is in, in achieving a certain outcome? Yeah. So, um, there aren't, um, it's a little bit tricky to answer that question because obviously there are a lot of people who do psychedelics, including mushrooms with a particular intention, but not in a clinical context. And they don't have all of the support that comes along with a clinical trial. So they don't have like the preparation sessions, the integration sessions, et cetera. And, you know, it would be really interesting to compare what are their outcomes compared to what are the outcomes of people who are going through these clinical trials that have all of this, you know, therapeutic support around this, the psychedelic treatment itself. Um, that being said, um, the outcomes um, of uh, trials that have been conducted for psilocybin, including uh, psilocybin for alcohol use disorder, psilocybin for nicotine cessation. And there was a small trial, I believe, that was done looking at psilocybin for cocaine dependence. All are um, pretty amazing. And, uh, you know, it, it is a part of the whole protocol that they, you know, all the participants have to have a certain number of sessions before the psychedelic to talk about what their intentions are, to talk about, you know, what they've been going through, and then afterwards to kind of make sense of what happened to them and to integrate the lessons into their lives. And it's just, you can't even really separate out the outcomes um, of those clinical trials, um, in terms of you can't really separate out the uh, the impact of the psychedelic itself versus the therapy because it's all just one package. Um, if you talk to anyone, you know, any psychedelic professionals like a psychedelic integration therapist or any of the researchers who are involved in these clinical trials, they will tell you that the therapy is absolutely essential. Um, and yeah, integration is like, the name of the game these days in the psychedelic fields. Like people often say that like first you have the psychedelic experience and then quote like the work begins because, you know, if you realize, you know, you should stop smoking because it's like for such and such and such reason while you're under the influence of a psychedelic, but then you emerge from the experience and you don't have any support in actually changing your life and in implementing those realizations, then you know, the chances that it's going to have a long-term impact are slim. Right. Um, yeah. And you talk a lot about integration in, you know, a lot of the articles that you write and, and through double blind. Um, but what specifically is it about integration that's so important? Is it just kind of like being able to apply whatever lessons you might've learned to your daily life so it can actually help you or um, what, yeah, what specifically is it about integration and, and what specific things are people able to do to help kind of integrate these, these experiences? I mean, a lot of what's discussed in terms of integration includes journaling, meditating, going to therapy, doing yoga, um, making space in your life after the psychedelic experience to actually kind of restructure your life to best support whatever realizations you had during the psychedelic. Um, the way you can kind of think about it is that, or the way that people often describe it is that um, the brain is sort of like a, um, if you imagine like a, a snowy hilltop and um, your neural pathways and, and, and there's a skier at the top and the skier, every time the skier do goes down the slope, it carves kind of a a pathway into the um into the hilltop and these are like sort of our habits or like our sort of thought loops like oftentimes you know people say that like we are comprised of our patterns right like we are all like 
we're all in like a habits of like thinking and feeling in particular ways. And those habits of feeling and thinking sort of like loop over and over again. And when you do a psychedelic, it's almost like a snowplow going over the hilltop where you are, you know, psychedelics induce neuroplasticity and they allow for the potential for you to create new neural pathways or new ways of being. But, you know, you have to, you know, continue to sort of like reinforce those new neural pathways and ways of thinking and feeling that were experienced under the psychedelic in order to create new habits, if that makes sense. So like if you, for example, under the influence of a psychedelic, were able to like access joy for the first time in a long time, like after the psychedelic experience, you need to engage in behaviors that like reinforce that feeling of joy so that it becomes a new way of being that makes so much sense and i I do love that analogy uh so much about the snow on the tracks and you know the ability to kind of get out of that groove because yeah so much of what we do in life is just going through the motions right and i think uh another way it's been described was um you know throwing a, a rock into a pond and seeing the ripples or like you know being able to see these things or being able to see certain patterns or certain behaviors that we normally just go through and we don't normally see, but seeing them from a different perspective. And, um, you know, that's how people are able to have these profound experiences and then able to actually make some changes in their life. Um, Michael Pollan has a couple of good examples of that in his book. I'm sure you've read it. I'm sure a lot of people listening to this have read it. It's called How to Change Your Mind. And, uh, you know, he talks about this smoking cessation study and in particular, uh, one person who did it and just, you know, saw herself, I forget exactly what, how he wrote it, but like saw herself as like a gremlin or something smoking these cigarettes. And then, you know, after the experience, she couldn't get that thought out of her mind. It was like a fresh sheet or a fresh perspective on this simple act of smoking that previously you would have just done it, you know, multiple times a day and never really thought about the impact. Um, have you read that book, by the way, uh, How to Change Your Mind? I have. What are your thoughts in general on it? It's definitely had a massive impact on, again, this 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 shift in narrative of psychedelics. But what are your thoughts about that book? I think it's good. You know, I think that Michael did a really, uh, he did the psychedelic movement a huge service by sort of popularizing conversations around the therapeutic potential of psychedelics. He, you know, he came into the conversation Um, having already um, an illustrious career that gave him uh, respect um, among people who may not have known anything about psychedelics before, you know, having already written several New York Times bestselling books, being a longtime contributor to The New Yorker. Um, And so, um, yeah, he made these conversations more accessible. And um, I would say that... um, Now he is um, taking steps towards uh, trying to kind of mainstream other conversations in the psychedelic space that um, we at Double Blind feel are really important, including conversations around Indigenous reciprocity and what it means to give back to Indigenous stewards of plant medicines, questions around access and equity, who's going to actually be able to have access to psychedelic therapy and medicines when they get to market. Um, I know that he made, in a, you know, we had him um, on the double blind platform and he spoke about how he made an, an intentional decision to not include some of that in his first book, just because he didn't want to kind of scare away people for which this conversation around psychedelics was new. And I understand why he made that choice. Um, but we look forward to, um, you know, him popularizing and other writers like Shayla Love at Vice and other folks who we really respect, uh, popularizing more nuanced conversations about the psychedelic industry, too. That, that's an interesting topic. And I think I've heard, you know, that seems to be an, an important part of uh, what you guys are doing at Double Blind. But can you give some examples around some of the conversations that are happening in that area? Are you talking about, um, you know, like maybe people in North America using some of these indigenous plants and, and mushrooms or maybe something like ayahuasca without giving, you know, it the historical and cultural context that it deserves? Or, or what what are some of the conversations that you're having around these these topics? Yeah, I mean, there's so much uh, here. I mean, I think the first thing would be, um, 
you know, just giving reverence to uh, the stewards of the indigenous stewards of plant medicines, like simply just an acknowledgement that, um, you know, indigenous communities all around the world, like I said, have been using psychedelics or they don't think of them as psychedelics, but plant medicines for thousands and thousands of years. Like we did a story on the Weechels, which is um, a indigenous group in Mexico that has been using peyote for more than 10,000 years. They actually have carbon dated the ashes of their ceremonial fireplaces um, in the desert. And uh, same goes for, you know, the Buiti um, in Gabon who use uh, iboga ceremonially. Now Ibogaine is gaining popularity in clinics all around the world for the treatment of opioid and heroin dependence. Same goes for, of course, psilocybin. Psilocybin has been used for thousands and thousands of years by people in um, Central America, the Mazatec. And so... Um, you know, when we think about, you know, the fact that now there are these companies that are poised to make millions and millions of dollars off of psychedelics, and the only reason in large part why we still even know about their therapeutic, medicinal, and spiritual potential is because, you know, these indigenous communities have continued to kind of been using them in the shadows for all of this time, like what is our responsibility to give back to, to these communities and to make sure that they are taken care of and that they have access to, the, to their medicine. Um, so that involves thinking about the sustainability of the, the medicine itself. So if you're drinking ayahuasca or if you are going to um, an Ibogaine clinic, like making sure that you know the source of your medicine, um, there's a lot of people, including the Native American church, who have called on um, people who are non-native to just stop taking peyote altogether right now, because peyote cactus is at risk of becoming endangered. If someone feels really called to have a mescaline experience, then they can look into, you know, San Pedro or, you know, a number of other mescaline containing cacti. They don't need to go into the desert and poach peyote so that natives have a harder time getting access to it. So these are just like all kind, all the sorts of things that we should be thinking about and talking about if we want to be conscientious plant medicine users. I think that's an important point because you're right, as the, you know, we're having this psychedelic renaissance, uh, you know, and psychedelics are becoming much more prominent in, you know, the, the culture in the U.S., it's important to not forget the history and to acknowledge where it comes from and the people that you said have stewarded these things through uh, for thousands of years, often uh, throughout, you know, being demonized for, for using them. Um, so, yeah, that's an important point, and um, I'm glad you brought that up. In terms of sustainability, just specifically in terms of mushrooms, um, you know, most of the mushrooms that are used in this context are uh, Psilocybe cubensis, which luckily are pretty easy to cultivate and, uh, you know, lots of people do. And very likely as this industry, I put in brackets, continues to expand, it will be Psilocybe cubensis that becomes, you know, the thing. Are there any kind of sustainability concerns around psilocybin mushrooms in particular? Or is that more concerning with things like you mentioned, ayahuasca or peyote? There aren't concerns around the sustainability of psychedelic containing or psilocybin containing mushrooms, but there are concerns around, again, just um, giving back to the communities that have preserved the knowledge around psilocybin mushrooms for thousands of years. Um, so, for example, um, you know, um, some of the, um, like the Mazatec, uh, who have a, an ancestral history of using psilocybin containing mushrooms, um, you know, there are nonprofits that you can donate to to help them simply like gain access to the basic resources that they need to survive and live and thrive. Um, and I'm happy to provide you with the names of some of those organizations and other organizations that people can donate to, to put in the show notes or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's important to remember when we're thinking about reciprocity, that it's not just like a one-to-one, -one, like I use mushrooms, so I need to like 
do something for the mushrooms. It's also about like entire groups of people and like all of the needs that they have. A lot of times indigenous communities, you know, they don't separate out their use of plant medicines from their territories, from the earth, from their ancestors. Like it's all perceived as a part of an ecosystem. And a lot of the communities that do have ties to plant medicines are literally just trying to survive. They're fighting foreign and oil, foreign oil and mining extraction in their territories, for example, like in the Amazon. Um, so, you know, if, you know, foreign oil and mining extractions are extraction is happening in a, in a territory, like it's not, I mean, yeah, it's threatening like the use of plant medicines, even if it's not threatening the medicine itself, because it's threatening their entire culture. Yeah. That's, uh, that's obviously a huge conversation and um, an important one as we talk about everything in, in this context. And I want to talk a little bit about microdosing because it seems like microdosing is this, well, it's not a new, hot new thing anymore, but you know, it's a relatively new uh, and it seems to be getting a lot of, of traction. Um, and for the people watching and listening, microdosing is essentially uh, taking small subperceptual amounts of psychedelics, usually either LSD or psilocybin, um, for a variety of purposes. But you wrote an article for Rolling Stone called The Case for Macrodosing. And so I just wanted to get your opinion on microdosing and why you think uh, you know, there is such a case or the importance of uh, macrodosing in that context. Yeah, I mean... Look, I microdose and I macrodose. I enjoy both. I find both helpful. Um, I think that that article, um, it was inspired by this idea that, you know, microdosing may not be the end all be all for everybody. And I know that some people are afraid to have a large dose psychedelic experience and not everybody is ready to have a large dose psychedelic experience. But if you are looking to completely transform your life, depending on your situation, it might be necessary to do a larger dose. And that's all I'm saying is that, you know, that's all that Madison and I were both saying is that, you know, microdosing has shown therapeutic potential anecdotally macrodosing of course there's tons of studies showing that it helps people with depression trauma and other conditions um you can do either you can do them together um but you know if you're going into a psychedelic experience you're engaging with psychedelics for the first time i think it's just important to do your research and to ask yourself critically what it is that you're looking to get out of the experience um, and, you know, there's a lot of people who talk about the importance of surrendering during a macro dose, this idea that you have to be ready to kind of get curious about or observe whatever it is that emerges for you. And if you go into a large dose experience with a lot, a lot of fear and a lot of, lot of resistance to the experience, then it may not be particularly beneficial or therapeutic because you may be fighting it the entire time. So in cases like that, microdosing could be beneficial for someone to kind of ease their way into psychedelics and to sort of acclimate to this idea that psychedelics may be therapeutic, but um, also like at a certain point, someone might need a little more to get to where they're trying to get. Right. And I guess that harkens back to the point you mentioned earlier about, you know, companies that are developing some of these compounds that give the benefit in air quotes of psychedelics without the trip. And you're saying, you know, that the, the experience or the macrodose experience or the, the trip per se might be a pretty important part in terms of what those mushrooms are doing or what the, what those compounds are doing and microdosing, although it may be beneficial for some things might be missing the point for, for other things. Um, do you think that is important for psychedelic therapists or treatment professionals to have firsthand experiences with these substances? Uh, or, or do you think it, it doesn't matter? Definitely helpful. Necessary? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I think that, um, you know, if someone is going through a really challenging psychedelic experience, then I imagine that 
it would be easier for the person who's holding space for them to know what to say or what not to say if they have had their own psychedelic experience before. For example, saying things like, it's going to be over soon, it's going to be over soon, may not actually be as helpful as saying things like, breathe, get curious, what's emerging for you. And if you've been there and you can like empathize, then you might have a better intuition about like what to say and what not to say. At the same time, you know, I do think that there are a lot of therapists and just like compassionate people in general, doesn't even necessarily have to be a therapist, could be like, I don't know, someone, a Reiki healer, or just anyone who's kind of in the domain of like supporting people on their healing journeys, like someone who knows a lot about mindfulness, who could be really um, good at holding space for someone on a psychedelic. So I just don't want to disqualify anyone if they haven't had a psychedelic experience. Um, it's just sort of dependent on the person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like that's with so many things in this space is there is no hard line answer, right? Everything requires a little bit of nuance. Um, I want to talk a little bit about double blind again. So you have obviously a lot of information on your site, uh, which is great. I mean, I think it's such a cool um, place. It's, you know, it's, it's fresh. It looks great. It looks friendly. It's a great place for people to go and get information about this stuff without having to creep around in the dark corners of the internet. Uh, but you also have a lot of courses. So why don't you talk a little bit about the courses you offer on uh, Double Blind and, and why you chose to, to offer those courses? Yeah, I mean, the courses were really kind of a natural evolution from the beginning of Double Blind because when we first started, we were just a print magazine. And, you know, Madison and I, my co-founder, really, we had no ambitions of being anything like what we are now. I mean, we just wanted to start a print magazine because we're journalists and we love print and we love psychedelics. And um, when we launched our Instagram before we put out the first print magazine to just start like raising awareness about the fact that we exist and building community, we began to get a lot, a lot of questions from people about how to use psychedelics. So we were just, you know, we were there to just talk about, again, like drug development, policy, indigenous rights, all of these things that are more newsy and journalistic. And we were hearing from like a veteran who was failed by the VA and wants to go to the Amazon to do ayahuasca, but doesn't like know where to go or a mom who has postpartum depression and wants to do mushrooms and doesn't know if she should or just we just started hearing from a lot of people who really just needed support on their journey with psychedelics. And we realized that there was just this massive need for education around how to use psychedelics that wasn't being met. And so that was really kind of like the birth of the second arm of double blind, which is our education. Um, we realized that through our reporting, even before we started double blind, that Madison and I knew a lot of the leading experts in the field, researchers, therapists, etc. And so it was just kind of, you know, it was sort of like a perfect synergy for us to connect this growing community of readers we had with these experts that we were already interviewing for the magazine. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense because, you know, all the information is out there. Right? It's the internet, you can dig up everything, but to have something in a nice sequential place where people can just, you know, learn and, and feel good about their stuff they're learning, but learn in a sequential order, I think it makes a big difference uh, for a lot of people. So that's really cool that you're doing that. Um, Quick question for you. I like to ask if you could buy like a Super Bowl commercial and you had 30 seconds to tell the world, uh, you could explain in one message to millions of people something. What would that message be? I mean, it's cliche, but Madison and I often talk about the relationship between healing the self, healing the community, and healing the planet. And so, you know, we talk a lot these days in the psychedelic industry about psychedelics for mental health. And it's really not just about mental health. It's about like healing yourself first so that you can be the best version of yourself for others and so that you can show up as a more conscientious global citizen. And I think that that's like the conversation that we need to be having more broadly is not just like oh, depression rates are soaring and anxiety is soaring and everyone's lonely. And, you know, it's like, what is actually 
going on on a deeper level here because what is happening for people individually is manifesting communally, is manifesting systemically, is manifesting politically. Like everything is connected to everything else. And that's what psychedelics show us. That's a, that's a good message. Um, I do have a couple uh, questions from the community as well. As people on YouTube, like I uh, said, I'm interviewing you and see what questions they had for you. Uh, the first question we already answered, which was, what are your thoughts on how to change your mind? So I'm glad we got to that. Um, another question was, and, and you may or may, may not know the answers to these. I just thought I'd uh, compile them all. But somebody asked, do you know of any beneficial compounds found in the psilocybe genus for pain or inflammation? And is that something that, you know, these mushrooms are sometimes used for? Oh, yeah, that's not um, I yeah, that's not a question for me. Um, that might be a question for one of the mycologists on our team. Uh, we have a class on how to grow mushrooms and we have five mycologists on the double blind team who are amazing, including Dr. K. Mandrake and Virginia Hayes of your psilocybin mushroom Bible. So I'd point you there. Um, and um, I will say that, um, as mentioned before, there isn't uh, very much research at all on compounds within psilocybin containing mushrooms other than psilocybin. I know that there's been some preliminary research done on aruganacin, um, but there has been some studies that have shown that psychedelics, classic psychedelics like LSD and mushrooms show promise for inflammation. And I know that there's a lot of interest in sort of the relationship between um, inflammation, the gut, mental health more broadly. And I think that psychedelics, one of the most exciting things about them, which we don't talk about, is that they um, have the potential to show us more deeply the relationship between mind, body, and spirit. And we know that, like, you know, there's no way that when someone is suffering from, like, inflammation, for example, that that's not having an impact on their psychological well-being and vice versa. Right. No, I think that's a perfect answer. You know, everything is connected. And again, it comes down to the nuance of these topics. It's not like there's, you know, one compound that might be good for inflammation. It's like, you know, that there's, there's a variety of things that are happening. Human physiology is complicated. The biochemistry of mushrooms is complicated. So inherently, the interaction of those two things is very complicated. Yeah. Um, but I will yeah, that, that, um, we have an article on our website by reporter Susanna Weiss talking about psychedelics for um, chronic pain that gets into some of the psychedelics for inflammation research. And also we have an article on medicinal mushrooms more broadly. And I would say that in addition to psychedelics, it's worth looking into um, like lion's mane, chaga, turkey tail, reishi, and a lot of the legal functional mushrooms that you can now purchase over the counter for inflammation. Yeah, I agree. And um, we will definitely, if we can find that article, we will put it in the show notes so everybody can take a look. Um, one other question from the community was, uh, people are talking, obviously we talk a lot about psilocybin containing mushrooms, mushrooms of the psilocybe genus, but what isn't talked about as often is um, the other psychoactive mushroom, Amanita muscaria, which obviously contains different compounds. But have you done any, you know, are you guys looking at any of the potential benefits of Amanita muscaria and specifically, you know, the benefits of maybe ibotenic acid and muscimol? Is this something that you're looking into as well? So yes, we are. And stay tuned for the articles that we're going to be publishing on Amanita muscaria shortly. Oh, okay. Awesome. Um, well, I am even personally excited to to read that because I think it's an amazing mushroom and it's not getting near the amount of attention that uh, it potentially deserves. And uh, it's another one of these things like we know so little about this stuff. We know more about psilocybin containing mushrooms, but we know very little about uh, Amanita muscaria and those other compounds. So I will let that person know to stay tuned. Final question from the community. In your opinion, or based on what you know, when do you think... Uh, psilocybin mushrooms will be decriminalized at the federal level or potentially legalized at the federal level? Well, as mentioned before, in the next three to five years, psilocybin is going to be legalized likely through the FDA as a prescription medication for, um, for major depressive disorder and treatment resistant depression. And then um, and I know that uh, Canada is kind of on a similar similar trajectory there and that they've slowly but surely been making exceptions and allowing terminally ill patients access to psilocybin therapy. Um, 
I also um, anticipate that more states are going to follow in the footsteps of Oregon and they're going to legalize psilocybin therapy on the state level. Um, and what's exciting about that, especially at least in Oregon's case, is that they're not guarantee they're not requiring that um, adults in the state have a particular indication to get access to the therapy. So in the case of FDA, you're going to have to have uh, um, major depressive disorder or treatment resistant depression unless you want to get access to it through something called off label, which is probably going to be really expensive because it's not going to be covered by insurance. Whereas if it gets legalized through the state like Oregon, anyone is going to be able to have access. Um, so I think that, um, you know, we're a really, really long way away from the federal government just like legalizing psilocybin recreationally. But I do think that kind of the way we saw it in cannabis, we are going to see this kind of state by state um, therapy model, hopefully um, grow. Exciting times ahead, I think for sure, you know, like you said, something, something's going to happen in the next three to five years. It's unsure exactly how it's going to unfold, but uh, we are living in interesting times. Uh, Shelby Hartman, people can learn more about you at uh, Double Blind. Um, you also have lots of articles that you've written on the topic that people can look up by Googling your name and mushrooms. Uh, <laughs> where else can people find you if they want to learn more about you or what you're doing at Double Blind? Um, I mean, they can follow me on Instagram if they want. Um, I'm trying to be better about posting, um, but I, I really hate social media, to be honest. Um, but my handle is at Shelby Ann, A-N-N-E, Hart, H-A-R-T. Very cool. And I will uh, put links to your articles in the description. I think there's like a contently uh, site where it just has all the articles you've written, which is really cool. And people can go and uh, learn a lot about um, psychedelics and policy and all the stuff that is happening in the space. Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you wanted to wanted to bring up before we before we land this one? No, no, nothing at all. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. And I look forward to connecting with uh, whoever tunes in who feels called to connect. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much. Uh, such an interesting conversation. I think what you guys are doing uh, over there is super cool, but also super important. So I really appreciate you taking the, on, taking the time to come on The Mushroom Show and talk about it. Of course, of course. Thanks so much.